I'm the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. Uh, I'm an independent lawyer um, who advises Parliament in particular and the government every year on the terrorism laws and how they're being applied. So have they got it right or are they getting it wrong? Well, the first point is that suspected terrorists have human rights, convicted terrorists have human rights, and that's because they're human beings. And that's an absolutely non-negotiable fact. Now, what the content of those rights are might depend on the circumstances. Terrorism law is all about the government's primary duty to keep us safe. And the difficult issue when it comes to terrorism is knowing how far the government can go, how far it can, if you like, impinge on human rights and the rule of law in order to ensure that we are safe. Now, I think in recent years, fueled by a very excitable media and a political class which is absolutely terrified of even the smallest thing happening, we have seen a great number of laws uh, which are aimed at making us safe, uh, but which do begin to impinge on people's uh, human rights, in particular the right to liberty, uh, the right to a private life, the right to privacy of one's data, and so on. Whether that balance is struck in the right place is ultimately for Parliament to determine and for the courts to determine, both here and in Europe. We've always taken the view in this country, I think quite rightly, uh, that if you are facing criminal trial and the possible loss of your liberty uh, in prison by order of the court, then you must have access to all the evidence that the state is using against you. You must hear everything, the jury must hear everything. That is the case in every single criminal trial. And if there is evidence that the state doesn't want to adduce because it's too sensitive, perhaps they'd be giving away secrets about how they've been observing you, for example, what devices they've been using, what human beings they've been using, then they have not to bring a criminal trial at all. The one area of compromise comes in other types of case, what we call civil cases, where you're not threatened with the criminal law, uh, but you might still have to face uh, other consequences. For example, uh, they might want to deport you if you're a foreign national, or you might be subject to other sorts of constraints that the civil courts can impose. And in those non-criminal cases, there are some circumstances uh, in which uh, evidence can be heard without it being shown to the suspected terrorist. They try to make the system as fair as they can because they do show all that evidence to a lawyer, security cleared lawyer, who is working for the suspected terrorist and defending the suspected terrorist's interests. So that lawyer can fight uh, for the suspect uh, but maybe not quite as effectively as in an ordinary court, because what the lawyer can't do is ask the suspect questions about the secret evidence uh, that he's heard. So it's a compromise. Uh, it allows the maximum uh, amount of a fair trial that is consistent with the requirements of national security. Once you've been arrested uh, for any ordinary crime, um, you cannot be held for more than four days by the police and even to hold you that long they need special permission of the court. If you're arrested for a, a terrorist offence you can be kept for up to 14 days and again you need the special permission of a court for that. And that's a long time to be held in detention uh, without charge uh, and um, the way they justify it is on the basis that terrorism is special. Now you might say you know, what's special about terrorism? It's, at the end of the day, it's killing people and it's damaging property, so it's an ordinary crime. Um, but, rightly or wrongly, the horror that terrorism evokes in the population is of a different order. And if uh, dozens of people are killed uh, in a terrorist attack, it just seems to be more shocking to people um, than if people are knifed, for example, in a, in a gang fight or something like that. So what the police feel obliged to do is to intervene sometimes earlier in a terrorist plot. If they're watching a drugs gang, uh, they might wait, they might bide their time until they know they've got all the evidence they want. Then they arrest and they charge straight away and the case goes to court. If they think people are planning uh, maybe a drive-by shooting uh, or a bombing uh, campaign in a, an English or a Scottish city, 
then they may feel they have to act that bit earlier because the consequences are, are that bit worse. That's why they are given this additional time uh, to decide whether to charge. The human right that is infringed when someone is detained uh, without being charged in a police station is the right to liberty. You know, we all have the right not to be banged up in prison or in a police station unless there's a very good reason for it. And that's why it's so important to have strong safeguards in cases where people have been arrested and haven't yet been charged. Many of them, of course, never will be charged. Well, people are stopped and searched for a number of reasons and to see whether they're carrying drugs, to see whether they're carrying knives, and in the terrorism context, uh, to see whether they are uh, terrorists. Now, where you need reasonable suspicion before you can stop somebody, and that's the usual rule, then the question of what race or heritage you're from shouldn't really matter because the police have to show in any event that they have a good reason for stopping you. And if they can't show that in court, um, then uh, they can face the consequences, which might not be very pleasant for them. The normal test for suspicion is a belief that someone may have committed a particular crime. Now, that might be something like carrying a knife or uh, carrying drugs. In the terrorism context, it could be having participated in or prepared for a terrorist act or possessing material possibly that might be useful in a terrorist act, something like that. Where it's much more sensitive is in the very small number of powers where you don't need suspicion to stop someone. You can just stop them anyway in order to determine whether, for example, they are a terrorist. Now, we used to have a power in this country that was used maybe a quarter of a million times a year on the streets and in the railway stations without the need for suspicion uh, to stop people in order to see whether they were terrorists. And there were suspicions that that power was used on a racially discriminatory basis. We don't have that power anymore because the European Court of Human Rights said it was wrong. And the then Home Secretary, who was a lady called Theresa May, uh, agreed with them. And so she agreed to repeal the power. But the place we still do have no suspicion power is at the port. If you're traveling through a port or an airport, then you can be stopped without any need for suspicion and asked questions in order to see whether you are a terrorist. The police and the intelligence agencies sometimes use surveillance in order to prevent or detect serious crime, including terrorism, uh, child sexual exploitation, um, and also in order to save lives, for example, in a kidnap situation. Those are the principal sorts of uses. There are lots of types of surveillance. What they have in common is that they uh, intrude on our private life, on things that we might otherwise consider private. So somebody might follow you around on the street. Um, if it was a very serious case, they might even put a bug in the wall of your flat or your house so that the police can listen to what's being said in that room. Uh, or they may even put um, a tap on your telephone so they can tell what you are saying uh, to other people, or at least you know, who you're talking to and when you're talking to them. Uh, when you get onto that sort of surveillance, which is a sort of digital surveillance, you also have a right to the privacy of your own data. Now that's a right you don't just have against the government, you, know, you also have it against Google and Amazon and all the other people who like to use your, your data. Uh, but you have it against the government too. And that's why these powers of surveillance, which can be extremely extensive, uh, also need very strong safeguards uh, to make sure that they're not abused. Normally, um, uh, the permission of a judge is required, or the approval of a judge is required, uh, before surveillance can take place. And there's an Act, uh, Investigatory Powers Act, which um, uh, I think will be enforced by the end of 2016, uh, which will extend that principle and require judicial approval uh, for really the whole range of surveillance. The rule of law is more important, I would say, when it comes to terrorism and security than it is in any other field. And that's because it is more tempting when it comes to terrorism to depart from the rule of law. A lot of people would like to say, uh, we can't stand this terrorist, let's just put him on a plane. Or why does he need a fair trial? Why can't we just put him in prison? Or why can't we use torture uh, on this horrible person to try and get the details out of him of, of why all these people were massacred? And we're all human, we probably all feel those reactions. And that is why it's so important not to reduce ourselves to their level. Uh, it is important that the most horrible uh, suspected terrorist has a fair trial, because they may turn out not to be a terrorist, but also because even if they are, 
uh, they must not have cause to complain uh, that we are unfair in the way we deal with them. And someone who's been convicted by a verdict of a jury chosen randomly from people on the street has no cause to complain, uh, convicted by a very fair uh, procedure. Same is true of, of stop and search. The key to fighting terrorism is to crack down very hard on the few thousand people in this country who really don't wish us well without alienating all the millions of perfectly law-abiding citizens. And if you start exercising stop and search powers, for example, just on the basis of the color of somebody's skin, then you're going to make an awful lot of people upset. Uh, you are going to put a lot of people out of sympathy with what you're trying to do, and you're going to make it more difficult uh, for yourself to fight terrorism. And as for torture, well, we've all seen uh, the effect of Guantanamo in the United States, the excesses that went on there in the last decade. And that handed an enormous propaganda victory to the terrorists. Just look when uh, Daesh, the so-called Islamic State, choose to execute somebody in Syria, they dress them in an orange jumpsuit, the same as the inmates of Guantanamo uh, used to wear. Uh, and what they are saying is, America is no better than us. It reduced itself to the same level when it started torturing people. It doesn't have any moral superiority, any moral credibility anymore. We're better than that. That's why we need the rule of law. That's why we need it particularly where terrorism and security is concerned.